Next, uh, I will be in introducing Mr. Freeman, uh, James Freeman, who is the editorial as assistant editor of uh, the Wall Street Journal. Before he went to the Journal, though, he was at the SEC, and he used uh, that knowledge of business and finance to help guide his writings, many, uh, w w which are many. Um, so without further ado, he'll be introducing. So, it's Freeman. Thanks, Rich. It's a uh, pleasure to be here and a uh, privilege and an honor to introduce William McGurn, editor of the New York Post editorial page. Our Wall Street Journal readers also know him as their beloved Main Street columnist. And uh, speaking of the journal, it's a pleasure also to be here as part of this program today with uh, my colleague uh, Mary Kissel and also uh, Brett Stevens, who was here earlier. Uh, we did offer a volume discount which uh, I think Rich appreciated, very compelling offer. Glad we were able to close the sale. And uh, you're now also, uh, Rich, entered to win the iHeart Entitlement Reform tote bag. So. Uh, aside from his great work at the Journal, journal uh, first as the go-to editorial writer and uh, later as, of course, the popular columnist, uh, Bill McGurn, uh, uh, also, of course, served as the chief speechwriter to President George W. Bush. And uh, in that capacity, he crafted some of the most important and memorable words of the last decade. Now, I, I confess, I don't know what it's like to be edited by Bill Buckley and then George W. Bush. <laughs> but uh, I imagine it's kind of like these transitions you see in the entertainment industry where a writer will polish their skills at Downton Abbey and then move on to Duck Dynasty. Um, it's, uh, it's very clear uh, how much uh, Bill Buckley respected uh, Bill McGurn uh, when uh, National Review uh, threw a reception in Washington to uh, uh, celebrate uh, Bill's new job with the magazine uh, there. Uh, Bill, Buckley, Bill Buckley brought along a surprise guest, the sitting president of the United States, George H.W. Bush. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a sweet story. It's uh, very touching. Uh, shows uh, the esteem that uh, Bill held for Bill McGurn. Uh, it also, uh, it's a problem for those of us who uh, are fortunate to be Bill's friends because uh, as with everything else he did in life, uh, Bill Buckley set a very high bar, uh, almost an impossibly high bar. So when there are those moments where you're uh, looking for uh, an opportunity to make a nice gesture, you remember that uh, Bill Buckley uh, brought the sitting president of the United States to Bill's reception, and you're wondering, should I bring the fruit basket or the scented candles? It's, uh, it's a little intimidating. But uh, anyway, Bill, I just wanted to take this opportunity to apologize and say that if I'd known that story when we had you to dinner, I would have spent a lot more time preparing the meal. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome my mentor and great friend, Bill McGurn. Thanks, James. That was uh, very nice, although um, you did make it sound like I couldn't hold a job um, <laughs> for a while. Uh, listen, before I begin, actually, I just see I just got chocolate on my tie, but before I begin, I uh, want to talk about the real future of conservatism, which is the students of the William F. Buckley Jr. program here at Yale. And, um, you know, I've known, I've known Harry for a while. I saw him when he worked at the Journal. And Lauren, you know, you were saying you guys can't do it all on your own, bring diversity to this campus. But that's not how you have to think of it, okay? You have to think of the Marine sergeant whose platoon was surrounded at the Chosen Reservoir in Korea. And he went to his guys and he said, Marines, the bastards have us surrounded. We can fire in any direction. And that's how you have to think of it here at Yale. I know there's 60 of you and out of a student body of 5,000, but you've got, you've got everything on your side. Uh, this is my first time at Yale, um, and I wish I could stay to see the 
Bulldogs go up against Fordham tomorrow. The only college game that I've managed to get to this year was uh, back at Notre Dame. The Monday after that game, a fellow alum emailed me about an article whose headline ran as follows. Is Notre Dame about to become the next Harvard or Yale? Now please understand, in South Bend, this is meant as a lament. <laughs> now those of you familiar with Yale football might know that our two universities did meet on the gridiron, but only once. That was way back in October 1914. The Bulldogs beat the Irish 28 to 0. But Newt Rockney, Newt Rockney was a player that day, later said that what he learned from Yale that day gave him the idea for the Notre Dame shift, which helped the Irish dominate the sport for the next decade. Now I bring this story up because I once mentioned it to Bill Buckley early on in my tenure at National Review. Now I was still new, so at the time I hadn't yet grasped that for Bill, pop culture references generally involved Edwardian England or the Medici's Florence. So when I finished my story about the game, Bill had only one question for me. Who's Rockney? <laughs> now when I was out at the Notre Dame-Michigan State game last month, I ran into Coach Brian Kelly. I told him about Bill and football and Rockney and Yale. He also had a question for me. What's Yale? <laughs> This is a long way of saying that Bill Buckley was, as James said, one of my two Yale editors for whom I was very proud to work. The other was George W. Bush. Now you might think of him as commander in chief, but for us in speech writing, he was definitely first and foremost editor in chief. Let me give you a flavor of what I mean. Toward the end of 2006, when Iraq was descending into chaos, we were writing what became known as the surge speech. This was one of those speeches that didn't explain policy. It was policy. So for nearly two weeks beginning the day after Christmas 2006, I would arrive in the West Wing before 6 in the morning and meet up with my colleague Chris Michelle, Yale 03, and the two of us would begin writing and we would not leave the room until 10 or 11 that evening. On the Saturday before President Bush delivered his televised address, we finally had a draft that cleared the whole process. So we met at dawn in the Oval Office. As the President read, Chris and I sat alongside members of his national security team. We were anxious for the President's reaction. Without lifting his head from the text, his first words were as follows. Page one is awful but it is not the disaster that page two is. <laughs> you can imagine how it went from there. And after that meeting, we learned that people suddenly were no longer eager to have their names attached to this operation. <laughs> the good news is that, that this left Chris and me free to fix the speech the way we wanted with almost no interference. So we did. Early the next morning, Sunday, we were back in the Oval. President Bush was already at his desk. As he took the speech in his hands, I said to him, Mr. President, yesterday you did not like page two. Essentially, Chris and I took out page two. So now when you look at page two, if you think of it as page three, it will go down a whole lot better. <laughs> the President just pushed his glasses down to the edge of his nose and gave me a look to see if I was serious, and I was, I was dead serious. <laughs> In any case, that was my other Yale editor, and he was a terrific editor, and I was very proud to work for him. <laughs> but my subject tonight is not George Bush, or Barack Obama, or even Bill Buckley. When Harry Graver asked me here, he also assigned me my topic, the future of conservatism. That is a broad mandate because conservatism comes in many flavors. We have Rand Paul libertarians, Mike Huckabee social conservatives, Dick Cheney hawks, Murray Rothbard doves, Art Laffer tax cutters, 
and so on. And historically, our publications have always reflected this diversity. Back in the day, a typical Bill Buckley headline in National Review might be, Will Formosa Save the United States? At the Wall Street Journal, where I later worked, it ran more to Onward Chairman Volcker. At the New York Post, we serve truth straight up. So our headlines are a model of conservative concision. Headless body and topless bar. <laughs> now tonight, I have no wish to suggest the right balance of economic, social, and foreign policy that would constitute the conservatism I believe most likely to prevail. I take my topic more literally, conservatism as conserving. And as I look out from my perch on 48th and 6th in Madison, in, in Manhattan, what I see most in danger of being lost is this, the idea that there are truths about man and that our freedom rests upon these truths. So my proposition tonight has three parts. First, the 56 men who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the cause of American independence did so firm in the belief that their claim to freedom rested on truths about the human person. Second, that while modern skepticism has eroded confidence in the idea of truth, it has not diminished the appetite for the absolute. To the contrary, into the void once occupied by self-evident truths have arisen multitudes of new orthodoxies from which dissent is treated as a mental or criminal disorder. Finally, my main point this evening, that though it is possible to conceive of a free society not rooted in the truths outlined in our declaration, it is a risky bet. Even if successful, it would mean leaving to our children and our children's children a society much different from the one Americans have fought, bled, and died for over the course of nearly two and a half centuries. So let me give, begin with the easy part. I assert as self-evident that the founders believed in self-evident truths and that these have implications for our government. The Declaration's basic argument is contained within its first two sentences. The logic runs this way. There exist laws of nature and inalienable rights. These rights are inalienable because they come from God and are prior to government. Governments are instituted to safeguard these rights. And a decent respect for the opinions of mankind means these propositions can be rationally put to the world. Most of this used to be plain old high school civics. But how many believe it today, and how many could defend it? Skepticism has left many of us with the uneasy feeling that truth outside what can be demonstrated scientifically cannot be defended rationally. Some would go further. They would tell you skepticism about truth is in fact the superior disposition for a free society. We are not without parallels. More than 60 years ago in God and Man at Yale, Bill Buckley asserted that Yale was undermining its students' belief in the truth of Christianity and the superiority of the free market. It is hard to recreate the animosity and fury he engendered, especially given how today's Yale happily embraces what yesterday's Yale angrily denounced as a libel. Perhaps the only way to conceive of the upset Bill caused would be to ma imagine a comparable bestseller today, arguing that while Yale pretended to multiculturalism and progressivism, it was in fact promoting the faith of Rick Santorum and the economics of Milton Friedman. <laughs> that leads to my second point. The decline of self-evident truth has not meant the departure of the absolute. It's meant the absolutes have changed. In place of truths about the human person that have been debated since Socrates, we today have multiplying orthodoxies whose dominance largely depends on their being accepted without question. How far we have come and how fast. One need only look at the crest of this university. It bears the motto, Lux at Veritas, light and truth. At Harvard, it's just Veritas. As an alumnus of a non-Ivy university, 
It's not clear to me whether this means my Yale friends require more light to recognize truth, <laughs> or whether the decline of classical language requirements means my crimson friends are under the illusion that Veritas is Latin for Harvard. <laughs> The irony is that the new orthodoxies, which have replaced the understanding of Veritas, have done so on the grounds of the one line of the declaration their advocates admire, the pursuit of happiness. Never mind that in Jefferson's view, and in the view of contemporaries who also use this phrase, the pursuit of happiness was more or less equated with the pursuit of virtue or the pursuit of the common good. We don't have to look far to see what has replaced it. In his Planned Parenthood versus Casey uh, ruling, Justice Anthony Kennedy, Harvard Law 61, put it this way, at the heart of liberty is the right to defend, to find one own, one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life. If I read that passage correctly, it means the meaning of meaning is now in play. How far this is from the idea that at the heart of liberty are self-evident truths, yet how apropos the Kennedy credo is for our time. Ours is an age when Private Bradley Manning decrees himself a woman and the Associated Press henceforth refers to him as Kelsey. What could be more liberating than declaring your gender in defiance of both anatomy and common sense? Most of you in this room have had your own dealing with these orthodoxies. You know from experience how brittle they are and that they are defined by hostility to reasoned argument. Question, for example, the evidence for man-made climate change and you will be equated with the Holocaust denier. Suggest that abortion might involve two lives instead of one and you are engaged in a war on women. Ask about the wisdom of devoting more tax dollars to government anti-poverty programs in light of what the great society has done to our inner cities and the African-American family, and you become an enemy of the poor. It's a curious approach to life, and it puts me in mind of the New York Times reader who regards the evangelical as irrational, but will tell you he reads the Times religiously because it's authoritative. <laughs> I do not profess to know whether it's possible to restore a language that has been lost. But if the basis of American freedom is the Constitution, and if the Constitution embodies the truths set out in the Declaration, it strikes me that when the foundation below is not sustained, the edifice above is imperiled. Which constitutes one of my chief concerns, that while we may continue for some time to get favorable Supreme Court rulings on many of the key points of political contention today, even these victories will be fewer and far between if the understanding upon which they rest continues to crumble. Let us stipulate it is possible to imagine a free society that is agnostic about truth, some sort of Rawlsian arrangement where freedom is the byproduct of a process in which we honor the freedoms of others in exchange for reciprocal respect for our own. In other words, a functional balance with no declarations one way or other about the source of human dignity. At times I've played with the idea myself, wondering, MacArthur-like, or maybe even Hayek-like, what constitutional liberty I might draft and what ideas I might base it on. But should we not admit the evidence for the success for such an arrangement, not to mention its sustainability over time, is thin on the ground? The American system of liberty has few rivals that have pers persevered as long or as successfully. And even were we to cook up a free society based on an understanding far different from the assumptions upon which America's is based, it would, at the least, be very different from the one we now know. For some, this might be a welcome development. There are conservatives, too, who make a case that all the stuff about nature's God and self-evident truths are frills and trimmings. Perhaps they are right. Even so, it still strikes me as a bet and one where the odds are not particularly strong. Let me be clear, just as Bill Buckley in God and Man at Yale 
emphasized he was not advocating Yale make itself into a seminary. I am not here denying that non-believers can be good Americans or champions of liberty, much less pushing for a Christian America. For one thing, though America has always been a nation with a majority Christian population, we have never been, and we're not meant to be, a Christian America. For another, the substitution of sectarian for self-evident truths would be a contradiction of the words I invoked earlier. Precisely because the Declaration cites a decent respect for the opinions of mankind, we know its signers were confident that their reference to self-evident truth would resonate with men and women across traditions and cultures. Still, I do suggest that those who believe in inalienable rights endowed us by a creator have a natural affinity for the warp and woof of our founding document. And as a purely practical matter, though in theory it's possible to maintain American liberty while remaining agnostic about its foundation, in reality I expect it would prove more difficult, at least at this point, absent a citizenry that included a healthy Christian community. I say this because of another characteristic that underlies the idea of self-evident truths and inalienable rights. The larger understanding of America, as conservatives understand it, is a society that is far more, far wider, and far richer than merely its federal government. So let me now end where I begin. I mentioned that tonight's topic was not my choice. It was not my choice for a simple reason. I do not spend much time dwelling on the future of conservatism. Partly that's because these discussions tend to be provoked by a contingent political development, a resounding defeat in a presidential election, or as we have just seen, a clash between different factions of the Republican Party. I am not indifferent to any of these developments, nor do I minimize their importance. Yet when I look to the future, I confess my thoughts run to what kind of America my three daughters will inherit and whether I am fulfilling the responsibilities of a loving father to prepare them for it. An appreciation for truth is part of this preparation, for the truths I speak of are not the cold cer certainties of some Inspector Javert. They are the tempering truths about our place in the universe that incline us to wonder and modesty and gratitude. They remind us whence comes our notion of human dignity, why to live fully human lives we must live within our human nature, and how it can be that the cultivation of virtue is, just as Jefferson understood, the pursuit of happiness. Bill Buckley once wrote that the high moments of our way of life are the gifts of those who have come before. In this sense, the future of conservatism is what it's always been, about first principles and nurturing appreciation for the patrimony of those who have handed down to us the freest, most wondrous society the world has ever known. That also makes the conservative enterprise something the press almost always misses, an enterprise of love. By this I mean we remain grateful for that which needs improving, even as we clamor for improvement for the government that represents us, the little platoons that civilize us, and the many cherished institutions, including Yale, that help us live lives that are fully human. If these are not worth fighting for, what is the fight for? Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for listening.